Okay, welcome to the first uh, deep dive into low Earth, satellite, low Earth uh, orbit satellite dynamics. And we're going to start today with translational dynamics. Although this is an attitude determination and control seminar series, I do want to talk about orbits and how that all works. And so, yes, the satellite is tumbling, and it, but it is also translating and moving through a certain orbit. And so I think it's somewhat important to discuss the orbit. Um, chronologically, Newton uh, ca actually came after Kepler. So Kepler, is, sorry, Newton is the one who was involved with uh, this equation, the sum of the forces is mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. Um, but the orbit and some of these equations down here that I'll talk about later in the video, those, uh, those equations actually came first. So Kepler was able to look at observations uh, of the stars and the planets just on the surface and come up with these orbit models. He didn't necessarily know why the orbits were happening or why they were elliptical or why they were circular, but he was able to draw conclusions based on his observations. Um, Newton was the one who came around and derived the theory of gravity and put all of these equations in motion and realized that if you integrate these equations in motion with respect to time, you get the exact same equations that Kepler came up with. And so this part, I'm just going to talk about Newton's equations of motion and how those work. And in a later video, I'm going to show how you can actually integrate these on a computer like Python or MATLAB. Um, and, but then uh, on this first board, I'm going to talk about Newton, and then I'm going to do a second board where I'll talk about uh, Kepler's orbits, because again, I think that's important for low Earth, um, low Earth dynamics. Okay, so I already said that this was uh, Newton's equation of motion, but I want to back up here for a second. This uh, sphere here, or circle is my best attempt at drawing the Earth. And if I go from the origin to the surface, um, I'm gonna draw a vector R with that little symbol there. And this symbol here is uh, the universal symbol for the Earth. So if I'm sitting here on the surface, this is gonna be some latitude and longitude coordinate. And if I have some comm satellite like DSN or just you know some hobby satellite, I can get ranging information from the surface to that satellite and I'm gonna call that uh, satellite to body, where body is the center of mass of the satellite, and um, that frame, that body frame, is fixed to the satellite. So the satellite is tumbling, but if you think about it, even if that satellite tumbles, the center of mass is always going to be in the same spot, because in space it doesn't, there's, it doesn't really matter like which way you're pointing or which way is down. Um, all that matters is the center of mass, and that approximation we can do here. If we, if we look at this uh, equation for Newton's second law and we look at some of the forces of mass times acceleration, we first need to get the acceleration of the satellite. Now this notation here says it's the acceleration of the body frame with respect to an inertial frame. And so you need to choose an inertial frame. Newton's, uh, Newton's equations of motion are pretty specific about inertial frames. And so we need to make some sort of approximation. You can assume that you know, the, uh, the, the center of the Milky Way is the inertial frame and that's not moving and the sun is moving around that. You can assume that the sun, sun is the inertial frame and you can use a sun-centered inertial frame and assume the sun is not moving. Or you can even approximate even further and say that the Earth is not moving and everything rotates around that. For low Earth satellites, that approximation, the latter, is totally okay. You can pick the ECI, Earth Centered Inertial Frame, and say that there is a frame, there exists a frame where the center of the frame is at the center of mass of the Earth and it does not rotate with the Earth. So the Earth, um, 15 degrees per hour, rotates with respect to that inertial frame, but not with it, if that, if that makes any sense. And so if I have my inertial frame, if I was simulating, say, Voyager 1 or 2, like out to Pluto, this orbit model would not be accurate, and I would need to get a more accurate orbit model. But for lower uh, orbit satellites, this is totally okay. Um, all right, so then if I draw a vector from the origin to the satellite, I'm going to choose three coordinates, x, y, and z. So I'm going to say those coordinates are x, y, and z along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. If I then take a derivative of this, because I'm, I'm measuring from... A, uh, and remember, these are two vectors put together. So because I am measuring from an inertial point, this inertial frame is not translating. So the velocity of this point is just the time derivative of those three coordinates. So that's why I have x dot y dot z dot. The dot above it is the first time derivative. And then again, the acceleration is just x double dot y double dot z double dot. So that's just two derivatives to get my acceleration, which means that my right-hand side is done. 
you take mass times x double dot, y double dot, z double dot, and that is going to be equal to the forces there. And again, I'll show you in some later videos, you can actually put these equations into a numerical integration scheme, and you can actually integrate orbits. It's pretty neat, in my opinion. So now we have to deal with the left-hand side. So the left-hand side has a couple forces. The most obvious one is gravity. Um, gravity is pulling everything you know, towards uh, something with a large mass. And um, that is sort of the theory of gravity that Newton came up with. There is one point that I need to make about this, this gravitational law here, and it's that the Earth is pulling the satellite towards it, but the satellite is actually pulling the Earth towards it. Now, the mass of the Earth is typically so much larger than the satellite that you can assume that the Earth does not move at all. Now, if you're doing like the Earth and the Moon, right, where the Moon is like, it's still smaller, but at least it has a pretty tangible mass, the Earth and the Moon actually rotate around a center point um, called uh, the Berry Center. And I, you've probably seen, uh, maybe you haven't, but I've seen things where people say that, you know, Jupiter has such a large mass that the Sun, wrote, the sun and Jupiter rotate around a Berry Center. And actually every single two-body or even three or n-body system have a Berry Center. And then what that means is that the two bodies are pulling on each other and they rotate about the center point. Now, because the mass of the satellite is so much less than the mass of the Earth, the Berry Center is going to be like literally right next to the center of the Earth. So you can just assume that the, uh, the satellite doesn't pull on the Earth at all and the Earth just stays fixed in the same spot, which is a totally reasonable approximation. Some other things that you might uh, not be aware of is that in space you also have solar radiation pressure. So the sun is firing photons at your satellite and that is imparting momentum. Those photons are, are colliding with your satellite and is imparting momentum. Over short periods of time, it's not really a big deal. Um, for a, a one U, for a one U CubeSat, which is a, a 10 by 10 by 10 CubeSat, that's 10, 10 centimeters, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, you're gonna get about four and a half millinewtons of uh, force. Yeah, uh, for a one U cube set, and so that's a lot lower than say you know gravity, which is you know around nine point eighty one meters per second, and that's just acceleration. If you have a one kilogram satellite, you know that's going to be nine point eighty one newtons versus four point five millinewtons. There, you know, you've got something that's three orders of a magnitude less. So a lot of times, if you're just doing a simple orbit, you'll just ignore that term there. But keep in mind, it, it does exist, and you do need to account for it. Aerodynamics is another one, too. At 600 kilometers above the orbit, so above ground level, above the surface of the Earth, you're talking about 6 nanonewtons. So the density is so low out there, you still have aerodynamics. I mean, the, the International Space Station is actually... It's actually lower than 600 kilometers. It's around 408 kilometers above ground level. So it's actually being hit with so much aerodynamic drag that every now and then the International Space Station has to thrust and, and thrust itself up into a higher orbit uh, because it, it starts to come in and it, it didn't do anything. It would just burn up the atmosphere eventually. But again, nanonewtons and millinewtons, those are typically a lot smaller. If you have a larger satellite, you can also throw thrusters on them. Okay. So the big one that we really need to worry about is this force of gravity. So the force of gravity, and you may have seen this before, is equal to two different things. The point mass model is the most widely known, in my opinion, and that is uh, g, the gravitational constant, which is something like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, times the mass of the Earth, which is something like 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, times the mass of the satellite, and then it's, this is some interesting unit vectors, you have to divide by the square of the magnitude of the, of the satellite. So as the satellite moves away, if you take the distance and square it, your gravity law is going to be proportional to 1 over r squared. So it, as you go away, it's going to fall off as 1 over r squared. So when you're really, really close, when you're on the surface, there is a ton of gravity you need to overcome. And once you're far away, 
you know, if you look at one over r squared, once r is big, your gravity is low. And so that's why they talk about these gravity wells. And that's why there's such a huge push for um, the deep space gateway, because it's in a position where it's so far outside the surface of the Earth that the gravity or the uh, amount of velocity required to push it to somebody, somewhere else is so much lower because the gravity is so much lower. This R with a hat on it is the vector from here to here, from the origin to the satellite, but it's a unit vector. So the magnitude of this vector is one. So this doesn't necessarily scale it up. So if you look at the magnitude of this gravity vector, it's g, the gravitational constant, times the mass of the satellite, mass of the Earth, divided by the distance from the center of the Earth squared. Um, this equation works if you're inside the surface, but if, if you're running an algorithm or a numerical scheme, I would just you know, kill the simulation if you went inside. Um, something else that people may not be aware of is this EGM 2008. So the Earth is actually not a perfect sphere. It's got, it's got mountain ranges and it, it, it uh, what's that word that I'm looking for? It spins really quick, it spins really fast and so it sort of, uh, you know, bloats at the, at the center line, right? Um, and so it's an oblate spheroid. And this EGM 2008 is actually a, a public repo, a uh, public source software that you can download and it will give you the gravity vector, this should be a vector, it will give you the gravity vector at any point in space. You have to give it the coordinates in what's called, um, you have to give it latitude, longitude, altitude, but there are equations to convert Cartesian to lat-long altitude. Um, but basically, you give it a coordinate in space anywhere, and it will give you the gravitational um, acceleration vector, which is, which is pretty neat. Um, but and again, you can download that if you want. If you're just doing something on your computer and you just want to integrate some orbits, the point mass model is totally fine. So the other things that I want to talk about in the orbit is that, again, when I was talking about Kepler and how he sort of came up with these orbits, is that if you have a low Earth satellite that's in some circular orbit, you're going to be some radius away from the center line. If you are in a perfectly circular orbit, you can actually compute the velocity required at that circular orbit um, using this equation here, square root of mu, where mu is equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth, square root of that divided by the distance from there. So you, if you look at this equation, as you get farther and farther away, you can actually, your, your velocity of a circular orbit is slower and slower and slower. And again, you have less gravity out there, so you don't need to f travel as quickly to overcome gravity. And remember, I, I, people have probably given you this analogy before. If you we're on the surface, and you fired a one-stage rocket, boom, right this, and you have what's called, this is typically this in, in rocket, uh, rocket science, this is called a delta V maneuver. You have a velocity equal to zero here, and up here you have a velocity equal to delta V1. So you are um, accelerating the rocket with some finite amount of uh, liquid or, or solid rocket propellant. If you stopped and turned off the rocket at this point, you would travel up to some maximum altitude called the, uh, the apogee, and you would just come crashing right back down, and that's what this X is. So this is sort of a parabolic trajectory. You can do this with the baseball. Throw the baseball in the air, it's going to hit some apogee, it's going to hit the highest altitude point, and come crashing back down. Now if you had a large enough rocket where up here, say you fired a two-stage rocket, and you performed another delta V maneuver, delta V2, if your delta V1 and your delta V2 put together, minus aerodynamic drag and losses and stuff, at 600 kilometers of orbit uh, above, above the surface was 7.56 kilometers per second, which is humongous, but if you were able to get your rocket or your satellite to travel that quickly, you would be in a stable orbit. Because what's happening is, is that if you're not traveling fast enough, you're just going to fall into the Earth. If you're traveling a little bit faster, you're going to keep elongating your orbit, right? Because remember, gravity is pulling you in. So you're traveling this way, but gravity is getting you closer and closer to the Earth. Eventually, you're going to get to a point where your orbit is going to be completely circular, and you'll travel in this circular orbit, and you'll never come. Well, 
remember, there's a small amount of aerodynamics and radiation pressure. Eventually, you will come back down. But if you're far enough away and you're traveling fast enough, you'll, you'll stay in this circular orbit. Okay? I don't want to talk too much about orbits because I'm going to do that in the, in the next video. Um, but this is it for translational dynamics. It's, uh, like I said, it's not too complex. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And post in the comments if you have any questions.